So uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, Shuma's Lunch and Learn series. We do these uh, once a month. And um, today I'm going to be talking about the basics of radiocarbon dating. Um, and, uh, you know, for those um, that don't know me, uh, I'm the science director at Shuma Archaeological Research and Education Center. Uh, and we're a nonprofit research center studying uh, the rock art of the lower Pecos. And let me make sure and get my slides to work here. Um, and uh, I, as the science director, my background is actually in chemistry. And so I um, am a chemist and I study things like pigment analysis and um, specifically radiocarbon dating. Um, and so uh, I wanted to um, first, though, for those of you that aren't familiar with our organization, um, Shumla is a nonprofit that is dedicated to preserving and studying the rock art of the Lower Pecos Canyonlands, which is located in Southwest Texas. And we do that via documentation, research, stewardship, and education. Um, and I have an archaeological chemistry laboratory that is um, sort of embedded uh, within our, our research efforts. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how that fits into our overall mission, because everything is interrelated. Um, so when we go to a site that we want to radiocarbon date, you know, we're interested in that research question. But it's also very important that the site's been properly documented um, prior to uh, any of the radiocarbon studies that we might do. And so, you know, we're really working with our archaeology team to make sure that we have photographed the site extensively. We have done illustrations of figures. Um, we understand how the figures are related to each other um, on the wall. And so that that, you know, really encompasses that documentation arm of our mission. Um, you know, and we're often working with uh, the landowner and the stewards of the rock art. And so there's open communication there about, you know, um, if I have visitors coming to my site, um, what, how should I, how should we tell people to visit a rock art site? Um, what kinds of things can we do to help preserve the site? And so there's communication there. And then, um, of course, we're promoting education because we're training interns. We have an intern program where university students come and work with us. Um, and we also have a high school program and uh, called the Shuma Scholars. And I know the class is on the call today, so that's really exciting um, to have them join us today, um, where we teach a research methods class to local high school seniors. You know, we're interacting with the local community as a whole, and we're also sharing our results with indigenous stakeholders, the scientific community, as well as the public. So with our research, we're raising awareness on the importance of these painted murals across the landscape. And there's even a bigger picture than just how old is this one figure at this one site, because um, we're working with the, you know, I, as the chemist that's doing the radiocarbon dating work and working with our archaeology team that is doing that documentation and interpretation research. And so we're dating um, imagery that is seen um, not only at maybe one particular site, but at multiple sites across the landscape. It could even be a core image that is um, shared um, among different um, indigenous groups across uh, the Americas. And so we're looking at sort of the tenacity of myth and tenacity of um, belief systems. Um, and so these are some bigger picture questions that we're going to be able to answer with the radiocarbon dating studies uh, that we're doing. Now, before I talk about how we as a team uh, work together to date pictographs specifically. Um, I want to delve into the basics of radiocarbon dating. Um, so, you know, you hear about radiocarbon dating, you know, okay, that tells me how old something is, but how does that work? And that's going to be really the bulk of what I talk about today. So, radiocarbon is an isotope of carbon 14, is an isotope of carbon. It's carbon 14. 
Um, and it's produced in the upper atmosphere. So we say that it is a cosmogenic isotope. It's just a fancy way of saying that it is produced in the upper atmosphere. And what happens is a cosmic ray from our sun and stars interact with our upper atmosphere to produce something called a thermal neutron. And then that thermal neutron then interacts with the most abundant gas that is in the atmosphere, which is nitrogen. And so then a nuclear reaction occurs in the upper atmosphere. It's called an NP reaction because it's a, a neutron in and a proton out. And in that process, a carbon-14 atom or carbon-14 isotope is produced. Um, this carbon-14, um, as I said, is produced in the upper atmosphere through this process. It gets quickly oxidized uh, to carbon dioxide. So um, you have carbon-14 in the form of carbon dioxide that is uh, mixed um, in our atmosphere. Now, there are three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. And, and you hear that word isotope and maybe you're like not sure what that is. And all it is, is it's the same atom, carbon, but they have different masses. So there's one that has a mass of 12, so that's carbon 12, and one that has a mass of 13, and that's carbon 13, and um, one that has a mass of 14, and that's carbon 14. Um, and so they all have six protons because that's what makes them carbon. So it's on that place in the periodic table of six because it has six protons. And again, that's what makes it carbon, but they have different numbers of neutrons. And so they have these different masses. Um, out of all of this naturally occurring carbon that's on earth, 99% of it is carbon 12. About 1% is carbon 13. And about, if you had a, one in a trillion, so if you had a trillion carbon atoms, one of them would be a carbon-14 atom. And so um, you have this mixture in all living things. Um, now, the carbon-12 and carbon-13, um, those are, uh, um, let's see, the carbon, let's see if I can get, sometimes laser pointers don't work great here. Here we go, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Those are what we call stable isotopes because they just sit there and they're happy as themselves. But carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope and it doesn't stay as carbon-14. Um, it is radioactive and it will eventually decay away. Um, and so that's what we're gonna use as our clock is that carbon-14 um, to uh, have that as our, our clock to be able to determine age. So we have our carbon-14 that was produced in our upper atmosphere. It got oxidized to carbon dioxide. And as I said, that gets mixed into um, the carbon cycle. Um, it gets mixed um, into the atmosphere. Some of it gets absorbed into the oceans. Um, you have plants that uh, undergo photosynthesis. So they're breathing in the carbon dioxide and um, producing sugars and all kinds of things uh, that make the plant. Um, and it's incorporating that carbon-14 into it. Um, you have the animals that eat the plants. And so then they're getting um, incorporating carbon-14 into their structure as well. And so all living things um, have basically a certain amount, the same amount roughly of carbon-14 in them while they're alive. And we actually call this um, a steady state. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, an analogy uh, for a steady state. And the best anal uh, analogy is a bathtub. Um, and so if you have a bathtub and you have the water faucet on um, and it's um, putting water into the bathtub, but you also have the drain open. So water is leaving the bathtub uh, from the drain. You can get the rate of water in and the rate of the water out such that the level of water in the tub remains the same. So it's a dynamic system. You have uh, water going in and water going out, 
but the overall level of water in the bathtub is the same. And this is called a steady state. And this is what's happening with carbon-14. Um, the water going in would be the production of the carbon-14 um, uh, in the upper atmosphere. And then the drain would be that it's a radioactive isotope that does decay away. Um, and so in that carbon cycle, as the carbon gets mixed among all the different um, materials and, and plants and animals and reservoirs, um, you have, again, what we would call a steady state, and that the amount of carbon-14 uh, is the same in all of those living organisms. Now, once an organism dies, it's not, you know, a plant's not photosynthesizing or the animal's not eating, and so they're not incorporating, you know, carbon into them. So it's as if the water has been turned off, but you still have the radioactive isotope. So the level of carbon-14 um, slowly lowers. And based on that lowering or that decay, we can, that does that at a specific rate, we can use that as a clock to determine uh, how old something is. So um, all uh, radioactive uh, decay is, is something that we call first order decay. So it follows this sort of um, exponential curve and there's a, a mathematical equation that, that describes this. Um, but um, you know, looking at your graph here, your y-axis is how many carbon-14 atoms you have. So how many are still there? And then your x-axis is time. So this would be like years ago. Um, and as I said, carbon-14 is radioactive. It'll eventually turn back into nitrogen-14 and release a beta particle. And it does so based on this equation. So time, years ago, um, and then how many carbon atoms we have. So we can calculate that. So I could come here and say, okay, uh, I only have half of the amount of carbon-14 uh, uh, then when an organism was living. And so I come across here and that is what we call the half-life, um, the time it takes for half of a material to decay. And for carbon-14, that's 5,730 years. And so I can say, okay, but if I have a quarter, I can come over here and then I can calculate the age. Um, and so based on how that um, amount of carbon-14 decays, kind of think about it as the water in the bathtub slowly draining, um, we can determine how old something is. Um, now this gives us a, an age um, and, and it'll give us, um, we use units called uh, years BP or years before present. Um, you can kind of think of that as years ago. Um, so something is 10,000 years old or, or this is, you know, was here 20,000 years ago. And you can do that. Um, when you get to about uh, 50,000 um, years old, that's where we can't measure the amount that's left anymore. And so radiocarbon dating, um, we can usually only date things that are 50,000 years old or younger um, because of our uh, inability to measure that small, small amount of carbon-14 that's still left. Um, I mean, remember in a living organism, if you had a trillion carbon atoms, only one of them was a carbon-14 atom. And so, you know, we're talking about very um, small detection limits and, and measuring things that are in very small amounts. Um, so anyways, we get this years ago and um, we do actually want to convert that to a calendar age, um, something that we're used to in a sort of not just years ago. Um, and it turns out that that's not an entirely linear relationship. And so we need a calibration curve where we can convert um, the, the time to um, sort of calendar ages that we're used to. And so we use um, things like tree rings um, to do that. And so this is the bristlecone pine um, and it's one of the things we use for standards. And you can, you know, look at the tree rings and then what they do is they actually radiocarbon date the tree rings. Um, and then um, they have a, a calibration curve. And so they'll have, you know, here what they got from that age equation that I was showing with the graph. 
And then where they counted the tree rings on the x-axis, the calendar year. And you can see that if it was a linear relationship, it would be this straight line. But it turns out that that calibration curve has some structure to it. And it has to do with um, things like sunspot activity and the magnetic field of the Earth and things that affect that production of carbon-14. Um, but we're able to measure those differences and we have this calibration curve. So, you know, we can radiocarbon date something and then again, we can come across and hit the, the, the calibration curve here with all the wiggles and then we can come down and we can get a calendar age. Um, and so uh, I use software to do that once we get measurements. Um, I use a software called OxCal. So here's an example where, um, and this is actually a, a weighted average, an average is always better than one single measurement. And so here I have um, 3,291 plus or minus 47. And so that's what's depicted here um, on this graph. And that is um, my T, my years ago from that age equation. And then the blue line is the calibration curve of the tree rings. So I come across and then we come down and we're using some statistics called Bayesian statistics, but it gives us these age ranges. And so it'll tell me that the sample is, um, you know, there's no rounding here, but uh, 1687 to 1491, uh, there was a gap where there was a low probability, but then um, it could have also occurred between 1484 and 1490, uh, 1449. And so, um, you get these calendar ages that are in um, here, BC, Cal, BC, that's something that I'm used to. Um, and uh, these, by the way, are uh, the ages that we have for Eagle Cave um, here in the Lower Pecos. So, okay, I'm kind of talked a little bit, and I know I'm kind of going fast, but I've kind of given a, a quick primer on theoretically um, how we get a number. Um, but what are we doing in the lab to um, get an age? Um, what are we physically doing? Um, so let's say that you have a piece of charcoal uh, from a hearth, um, like in that somebody's excavated and they wanna know um, how old uh, was this fire hearth? How old is that charcoal? The, the, the wood charcoal, the, um, you're dating the age of the tree. Um, uh, and so, you know, you have um, the sample um, and it's got that charcoal in it, but it's been buried in the dirt. It's been, you know, excavated. And so there's dirt all around there. And so you don't have just the wood charcoal. You may have some uh, uh, other things that have been incorporated into your sample. And so uh, we're always worried about contamination. And so we want to always make sure that the thing that we're radiocarbon dating is really the thing we want to radiocarbon date and not the contamination. And so um, you might have your wood charcoal, but there would be some dirt. That dirt might contain inorganic minerals. Um, and the one that we would be the most worried about would be um, like calcium carbonate, because that also has carbon in it. And we don't want to know the age of the rock. We want to know the age of the wood. And so we need to make sure that that is removed. Um, there's also things called humic acids in soils. Um, what happens is you get leaf matter and um, insects and all kinds of things that get incorporated into dirt and they decompose. And when they do that, they kind of form a class of molecules called humic acids. And you don't want to date sort of that leached organic material that um, might have gotten soaked into your sample because it might not be the same age as the wood. Um, and so you want just that wood. So what do you do in the lab to deal with that? Well, you, you wash it. OK, and so what we do is we do an acid wash and that will remove the carbonate. Basically what we wanna do is we wanna remove all of this stuff and just make sure we have wood charcoal. Now, obviously you would physically look at it under a microscope. You would kind of brush it clean and you would 
say, maybe get an interior sample. But just because you did all of that doesn't mean that you don't still have small amounts of some of this other stuff present. So you would wash it in acid and that would remove your carbonates. Then you would wash it in base and that should remove your humic acids. Um, we often do, a, a laboratories often do another acid wash um, that is just to make sure you got rid of all those carbonates. And so um, you'll hear this sort of term ABA or acid-based acid. Sometimes it's AAA, acid alkali acid uh, wash uh, that is done. And then um, after you've done that, uh, we do, uh, the laboratory would do something called combustion. They would heat the sample at really high temperatures uh, to turn the sample into carbon dioxide. And then um, that's just to get the carbon into a measurable form because you can't just, you know, wave a tricorder over the piece of wood and go, how old is this? You've got to measure those isotopes. And so you burn it to get that carbon as carbon dioxide. And then we actually turn that into graphite and then you do the isotope measurement. So I know it's a lot of steps, um, but this is a typical archeological sample and how it is radiocarbon dated. Um, so let's see here. Here we go. Um, so this is a, a picture that I got off the internet from, I believe, the uh, Belfast Laboratory. Um, and this looks like their combustion line where they're turning that um, carbon dioxide into graphite. Um, and then after it gets turned into graphite, we said that you do isotope measurement. Um, and so this involves using something called accelerator mass spectrometry. Um, and so uh, this is a, a, a photo here, it's kind of an older photo, but I love it. Um, it's, it's part of the instrument that is at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and that's a, a lab that I collaborate with. And um, you're just sort of seeing about half of the instrument here. These re this is a, a really large instrument, um, and it's got a particle accelerator here in the middle. Um, so your graphite sample would be loaded. It's actually back in this cage um, back here in the back of the photo. It's loaded. Um, a cesium sputter source creates carbon ions that then get put through a magnet and then they get pushed through the particle accelerator. Um, and there's some reasons to do all of this to make sure you're getting uh, rid of things like carbon, um, like uh, molecular ions and some things that are, are interferences. And so, um, but on the back end, you're actually counting the number of carbon-14 isotope and the number of carbon-13 atoms. And so you look at that ratio and that ratio then gets put back into this graph where you come across and you hit and you calculate the age. Um, so uh, once we have that age, we can calibrate it and then convert that. Um, so this would be the T that you get from, from this calculation right here. Um, and that this is for Halo Shelter um, here in the Lower Pecos. And it would be um, 2004 plus or minus 12. This is an average again. That's why that error is so small. But you come across and you get um, a 45 to 65, a 45 BC to 65 AD. Um, calendar range. And so that's pretty remarkable that we, we can get these numbers um, uh, from radiocarbon dating. So that's all great, but how does that translate to dating pictographs? Um, and so um, your sample is very different uh, for pictographs um, because you um, need a different laboratory procedure and a few different methods even though the principles are the same. And that is because uh, this is painted on a rock. And so there is a lot of carbonates there. And so um, 
it's a sort of a special case where you have minimal organic material and a lot of uh, inorganic contamination that you're not interested in. Um, and so this is a pictograph here from Halo Shelter in the Lower Pecos. And so we want to know how old is that painting? And so if you think about the, the this is a, a very tiny um, paint chip. You've got the rock substrate. Um, you have the paint layer that's soaked into the rock. And then you have a mineral accretion. And we want only the organic material that is in this paint layer. And unfortunately, um, there is a lot of a, a carbon material that is in this rock and accretion that we're not interested in. And so just very quickly, we've got our sample here for dating pictographs um, and you have a pigment and that could be charcoal pigment that has organic material in it. But um, in a lot of instances um, here in the lower Pecos, that is a mineral pigment. So there's nothing organic there to radiocarbon date. Um, but we do have binders and vehicles which do have organic material that was added to the paint recipe. Um, and then you have the stuff that you don't want. You have the rock that has the carbonates and oxalates. And so I have to have a way of getting rid of this or only getting this, this um, binders and vehicles. And so our lab procedure is a little bit different. We um, just do a base wash um, and that's just to make sure I didn't add humic acids here, but they could be present. Um, and so we do a base wash. But instead of using combustion, we do something called plasma oxidation. Um, and that's what's unique about dating pictographs is this technique um, uh, called plasma oxidation. Um, and then after that, it's pretty much the same where you turn the extracted carbon into graphite and you do your AMS measurement. So let's see. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So um, if we're radiocarbon dating the organic material in that paint layer, we might powder our sample we would look at it under a microscope, we would wash it with base, um, and we would filter it and dry it. Um, and then it would go into this instrument that you see this photo of here, and this is um, plasma oxidation. So we're doing this instead of combustion. We're using electricity to convert the organic material in the paint sample to carbon dioxide so we can do the isotope measurement. Um, one of the things that we also do is we um, analyze control samples of unpainted rock, and it goes through the same process uh, that a paint sample would go through. Um, it's very important to have controls uh, when you're doing these types of measurements. Um, so we want to make sure that the organic material that we're extracting is, is from the paint. And so again, we're using this method called plasma oxidation. Um, you know, it was developed by Marvin Rowe at Texas A&M, um, and, and John is on this call. He was part of his PhD dissertation uh, back in the 1990s. Um, and you have this schematic here where a lot of this is just plumbing. You have to have a way to remove all the air um, so that you have a vacuum. You have your sample in this glass chamber. You have these copper electrodes that you're running um, RF. Um, through so that you're creating that glow discharge or the plasma. And that is um, reactive enough to react with that organic material from the binders and the vehicles and the paint to make carbon dioxide, um, which you uh, collect by freezing or immersing your um, additional tube here in liquid nitrogen. Um, so that freezes that uh, carbon that you're extracting. Um, and then you can use a blowtorch uh, to seal off that tube. So you just have that tube of carbon dioxide that is from the organic material in your paint sample. And um, that is then what gets sent to the AMS lab um, to do the isotope measurement. 
Um, so I showed you that sort of simpler picture of just the one chamber, um, but what we've done here at my lab in uh, Shuma is um, we wanted to be able to be more efficient and um, process um, additional samples. And so we built a 10 chamber uh, system here. Um, and so um, it does the same thing that the one chamber system does, but uh, we're able to process 10 samples um, in the time that uh, we would do uh, one sample. And um, again, you know, your paint sample goes here. Um, you turn on the electricity. This reacts with the organic material in the paint um, and turns it into carbon dioxide. But what I didn't say that makes this so special is that it is below the decomposition temperature of the carbonates and the oxalates. And so they just stay there as a solid. Um, and so you're only pulling out the organic material um, from the paint samples. And so this was a technique that was developed specifically for dating uh, rock art because you have such a high uh, mineral content. Um, we do also do some interesting things in the laboratory where, you know, we get direct dates on the paint. Um, but uh, we have also been looking at the mineral accretions that are um, both over and underneath um, paint layers. And those mineral accretions um, have things called calcium oxalates in them. Uh, which we can also radiocarbon date. So we're able to sometimes get minimum and maximum ages for paintings uh, by looking at those mineral accretions. Um, so I wanted to show you some real data. Um, this is from Jackrabbit Shelter here in the Lower Pecos. And let's see, one, two, three, four, we got five. Um, so this is turned on its side because the graph doesn't look very good the other direction. Um, so you've got your calibrated dates here. So this is uh, in BC. So, um, uh, and here the red line is the average of all of those um, direct dates on paint uh, from Jackrabbit Shelter. And then I was talking about how we do sometimes uh, where we date the mineral accretion above and underneath the painting. And so here I'm adding the oxalate dates um, for that. So um, here you have, come on mouse, um, it's not gonna cooperate. There's too much of an internet delay. Uh, but anyways, you have your direct paint date and then above you can see um, the accretion that's coating those paintings is younger and the accretion that is underneath the paintings is older. And so here's those direct dates. And then here are those oxalate dates. And so this is just sort of like getting a second opinion. It tells us that we can trust those direct dates a little bit more because we have these indirect dates that agree. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you're not able to get the direct dates and you can only get those indirect dates. So at least it's something. Um, so at Jackrabbit Shelter, the paintings are um, around 2800 to 2630 uh, BC. Um, this is another site in the same canyon, uh, Jaguar Shelter. And again, these are direct paint dates. Uh, we have some uh, oxalate dates, min and max uh, dates for this site, but not as many. But again, you can see that the ones that are over the paintings are younger and the ones that are underneath the paintings are um, older. Um, but what's significant about this is the age. Um, these are some of the oldest ages we have for Lower Pecos rock art. Um, and so at about 3630 to 3370 um, BC. Uh, we're currently working on a project to radiocarbon date um, rock art throughout the region. And so here is sort of a graph of some of those dates and, and where they fall. Um, and so um, as we collect more data, we'll have a better idea of how long this style of painting persisted, um, what are the oldest ages, what are the youngest ages, um, and how that all fits together. Um, this is part of uh, a project uh, called the Hearthstone Project 
uh, which is partially funded by the National Science Foundation and, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, you know, that sort of pays for the actual dating and stuff, but doesn't support some of the documentation. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, we're really um, trying to raise money to continue uh, this project. Um, what makes this so special is not just that, you know, I'm doing this radiocarbon dating, I was going to say in a vacuum, and that's kind of funny because I do vacuum science, but, um, you know, it's, it's part of a team effort. Uh, where we're looking at the styles of the art, we're looking at indigenous knowledge, and it's really this sort of interdisciplinary nature um, that we are uh, really fortunate to have here at Shumla. Um, I want to thank uh, all the people that I work with, uh, uh, Dr. Deanna Radio Rolon, Phil Daring, and Carolyn Boyd, um, as well as um, all of the Shumla staff that, that make this work possible. Um, and uh, I wanted to end with this. Uh, we are starting our individual giving campaign um, and uh, we've raised uh, 94,000 so far, um, but we have a goal of 250,000. And I also just love this photo. We've got um, David Keim, one of our, our archeologists um, and we have Naomi Ruiz, who was an intern. Um, she was just here, she just left. She's, got, she's a, a mural conservator. She's just got a job um, doing some conservation work at a church outside of Pittsburgh, but she really is interested in rock art. Um, we've got Dr. Deanna Redio Rolone, and we've got Seamus here, one of our archaeologists. And you know, I can't do this work without this team. Um, they're just fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and let you guys ask some questions. The first question in the chat is. We're, are you measuring the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 13, not carbon 14 to carbon 12? And that's correct. It depends on which AMS laboratory you're working with. Um, some of those instruments are set up differently at the different labs. There are about 35 or 40 of these instruments around the world. Um, but most um, instruments that I'm familiar with measure 14 to 13. And that's just because of the sheer number of carbon 12 atoms versus carbon 13 atoms. And so, um, you know, they get a good ratio measurement when they do 14 to 13. Um, let's see, the next question is, are there other methods for dating rock art besides carbon 14, like optically stimulated luminescence? So um, there are uh, the, um, there is um, an, a researcher that back a, quite a while ago was looking at um, OSL for uh, wasp nests that are over rock art. And so he um, was able to get um, min and max ages for that. There's a new study um, that's out uh, for some rock art in Australia on the Burrup Peninsula. Um, I have not read the original research article. I've just read some of the news articles um, so far, but that just came out this week um, and they're using light um, to, to do that. Um, so I'm really excited to see, um, and that's to date petroglyphs, like the carvings. Um, and those are, you know, a lot harder to date because you don't have something that was left behind to radiocarbon date. You're, you're carving a, a material away. Let's see, um, Mike asked, a few sites were sprayed with kerosene years ago does that eliminate your ability to date them? And so um, the answer to that is, the short answer is yes. So um, back in, I don't know, the forties or so, when people, photography methods were not as good, you know, you hear sometimes people wanting to spray water on the rock art to help bring out the color for photography. We don't have to do that anymore because we have all of these digital methods that do that. Um, but in the desert area, the water evaporates so fast that sometimes you couldn't get your photo. So in the 40s, they would sometimes put kerosene on and that would wet uh, the petroglyphs. And, and that sounds horrifying to us today, but back then they thought, hey, I'm getting a good photo. Um, but um, so there's one site here in the lower Pecos, plus I know of two or three sites in other areas around uh, the US where this has been an issue. Um, and that's why we take those control samples of unpainted rock, because if I process that background sample and it goes through all those steps, 
um, and I get lots of carbon from the unpainted rock, then I'm pretty sure that you know it's contaminated. I might not know what it's contaminated with, but if I then send that in for radiocarbon dating and I get an age that's like 40 something thousand years old, then it's that I'm dating the kerosene and, and not um, the paint. Um, there was one site here that we just studied and it was on um, Grider's list of sites that he had used kerosene. And we really wanted to study that site. And so we went back and we read the reports more carefully and it turns out he ran out of kerosene. So we only did like, like an eighth of the wall. And so we were able to take backgrounds from where he didn't spray kerosene and, and check and make sure that there wasn't any contamination. And so we were able to get um, dates on that. Do the thermal neutrons act with molecular nitrogen or monatomic nitrogen? I actually haven't really thought about that much. If the former, how does the carbon 13 single friend? I would assume that there is a lot of energy involved in these processes. And so you're probably breaking that nitrogen nitrogen bond um, because you know, you're talking about um, cosmic rays coming in from stars, so very energetic particles. Um, and so um, what's actually, you know, getting converted would be, um, I think, the monatomic um, nitrog uh, nitrogen to carbon. And that gets, I mean, this all happens so fast, right? This is just a, a very fast process. Okay, somebody asked, how much does it cost to date a sample of a pictograph paint? Um, what about a charcoal sample? Is that more expensive? So, um I um, only work with pictographs because it's kind of my specialty. Um, and we're charging, depending on the number of samples we're collecting right now for outside contract work, we're doing um, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 uh, per sample. If it's just one or two samples, it costs us more than if we're gonna do like a project with like 20 samples. And so we can sometimes get costs down that way. Um, I think, like if you went through beta, I'm not going to say they're a commercial lab. I'm not sure how much they charge for charcoal nowadays. I would say probably about 650, 700 would be my guess. Um, but I'm not absolutely certain on that. Erin, can you go back to uh, that contaminated site? You didn't tell what the, what the differences were between the contaminated and uncontaminated. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's, um, a site, I can't remember the trinomial, it's like 38, 39, BV 38 or 39. It's um, a, the site right next to Big Satan. It's We call it uh, Satan Canyon Gallery. And it's um, one of the sites that um, Grider said he sprayed kerosene because we had, we had gone through um, and read those old reports and we had just made a list of all the sites that we thought had kerosene contamination on it. Um, and so that site was on the list and we thought, oh no, we're not going to be able to radiocarbon date it. And so actually I had my intern, Naomi, who was in the picture, she went through and reread those reports and he talks about only doing like a certain, he, he had his panel numbers for the site and it was only like from the, like you're looking at the shelter from the right he, they only did like what I, we would call like the first section um, where they sprayed kerosene. So I actually didn't take any samples from that section. Um, but if I did, I would assume that the background would be really high, that I would get lots of organic material um, from that. Um, but we did go and before we collected paint samples, we just went and took um, unpainted rock near where we might want to look at for dating. And I processed those first and all of them were clean. We didn't have any contamination in those. And so we are, um, you know, it matched what he had written in his report that they didn't spray kerosene on that section. Um, and so then we went back another time and, and let me tell you, it's a really big hill to climb to go back. So we're going back and back um, but we went back to the site and um, we, um, I have the samples. I have not processed those samples. They're waiting for me uh, to process. So I, I need to 
to get to work. Um, but, um, but, you know, so when, the thing that I learned about that from that experience is you need to be a little, like, it doesn't hurt to test the backgrounds. It doesn't hurt to test those controls because somebody says, oh, I sprayed kerosene on it, but they may have only done it in one small section. They may not have done the whole panel. And so, um, you know, that's something that, that I learned. I mean, now you may find out that you test it and it's contaminated, but it, you know, I think some of these sites, there are specific research questions that people have that it's important enough to check. At what age is the decay curve considered too flat for reasonable accuracy? And that would be about at that 50,000 year um, age limit that I said that, um, so um, the question was asking about that decay curve and how far back can you go and where does accuracy? Now you do start getting larger error bars um, when you get into like the, the 35,000, um, 40,000 year range, but it's still like plus or minus 200. I mean, it still gives you a good idea of how old something is. Um, and then, yes, this is a good question. Um, and I didn't talk about this. I thought about talking about it. The next one said, did human nuclear detonations uh, like at the Trinity site and the Nevada test site change carbon-14 calculations? And yes, they absolutely did. Um, because uh, uh, the um, what happens is that nuclear reaction from a nuclear explosion produces thermal neutrons. So it's producing that same thing that's happening in our upper atmosphere that's producing carbon-14. And so if you look at radiocarbon dating, like tree rings um, that are uh, really uh, recent, like past 1950 um, AD, um, you see a spike in the amount of carbon-14. So we all have a lot more carbon-14 kind of in us uh, than, uh, they would have, you know, before those atomic explosions, we're fine, we're safe. But the issue is that it messes up that calibration curve. And so it makes it harder to um, radiocarbon date anything from about 1680, 1680, 1700 up until present times, because um, you can get a measurement and your measurement's accurate, but um, figuring out what that means on that calibration curve and where it falls um, is hard to, to determine um, on a calendar age basis. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, Mark Leff, my friend Margaret, said that um, Marvin, so my former PhD advisor, Marvin Rowe, who developed this technique, dated a site in West Texas uh, where they thought... Um, hydrocarbon. So like, um, I've seen that before um, with a project I did with John Russ, who's on the call too, where um, maybe they're using like bitumen as pigment. And so um, you get older ages um, because you're dating whatever material is in the paint. And so if it's not, if it's something that's not from a tree or from a plant or an animal, but if it's from like hydrocarbon, like a bitumen, you know, you're gonna get an older age um, because of what you're dating. Um, somebody said, how far back can you go to calculate the correction curve? So that calibration curve, it's it's really improved in the last um, so 10 years. Um, what they've done is, you know, they were dating tree rings, but then to get those really, like when you're talking about 30, 40,000 years ago, um, they're looking at things called lake vars. So if you have like a natural lake and you have a river that runs into it, it floods every season. And so you get organic debris depositing in the lake every year. And so they take like core so sediment cores from the lake and date those. Um, and then they've also done um, where like in caves where you have stalactites and stalagmites and they, those are annual often layers in those. And um, so they've radiocarbon dated those. And so I believe the calibration curve goes back to about 46,000 years, um, which is just phenomenal. So you can actually calibrate things um, that are, are really old. Um, yeah, and then somebody talked about the nuclear bomb tests. Um, so absolutely that that increased the amount of carbon 14. The industrial revolution also kind of messed up the calibration curve uh, because you're introducing large amounts of uh, what we call dead carbon uh, 
coal that doesn't have any all it's so old that all the carbon 14s decayed away and so you're you're introducing um you know different levels of carbon into that carbon cycle um and yeah and somebody said you can also calibrate older carbon 14 with uranium thorium uh and that's where they're doing the the stalactites and stalagmites where they're looking at the, those ages there um i would there's quite a bit of error on those uranium thorium dates, but, um, but if you have a sequence of uh, rings, you can get good calibration uh, in that instance. Okay, what else? Does anybody want to ask a question? Yeah, Karen, I have a question about your calcium oxalate. Uh -huh. uh, two things. Uh, one is that uh, the process by which it forms, mm -hmm. and how does, is there variability from, uh, limestone locations or limestone locations in that, the, the ages of that. I'm very curious about how that forms. I was fascinated to find out, oh my gosh, these things have a, uh, you know, we were all worried about the, you know, painting, painting, painting and stuff like that. Well, it's not going to because you have that oxalate layer. Uh, but is how does that form? <laughs> so that's a great question. And it's funny because John's on this call. So this is a research question John's very interested in as well. I'll do a quick answer and then I'll let John talk about it. Um, there are multiple theories about how it forms. And I don't know that there is any one set answer that has been accepted as correct. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of studies on like limestone sculptures and like Italy and stuff. And they were basically saying that it's like microbial growth um, or lichen that is excreting oxalic acid as a waste product. And then that's precipitating out as calcium oxalate on these limestone surfaces. Um, part of my issue with that is that it's on the entire surface. It's not just, you know, here and there, or at least that's what we think. Um, there's still a lot more work that could be done. Um, there's another theory that um, John can talk about, but that there are atmospheric, there's some of these oxalates occur in atmospheric aerosols and that they're deposited on the wall through um, sort of just air um, interactions. John, you wanna kind of chip in here? Uh, yeah, thanks. And hey, it's good to see you, Harry. It's a long time. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. I just wanna tell you before, before, before you answer your question, I just want to mention to you, I was last month, I was in Santa Fe and he gave a talk and Marvin was there. And he uh, had told one of the ladies in the audience, he said uh, that uh, radiocarbon dating rock art changed his life. And I see his legacy carries on. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, um, most uh, people that actually study the oxalates on these rock surfaces think it is microbial, whether it's microbes, like and like like um, like Karen was saying, a paper that, that just came out this year where we were doing the trace organic analysis of these oxalates in, uh, from samples from the lower pecos. I had a bunch of lower pecos oxalate samples, and we we saw a lot of compounds that are similar to, if not exactly the same, that are the most abundant uh, compounds in atmospheric aerosol. The most abundant com organic compound in aerosols is oxalic acid, which will react with calcium on that limestone surface to make calcium oxalate. But there's and oxalate is what they call a dicarboxylic acid. It's mm -hmm. two carboxyl groups on a molecule. And aerosols have a lot more of those dicarboxylic acids, and we were detecting a lot of those. So it's almost like it, it, we're we're proposing now or hypothesizing that at least some of these oxalate coatings are reactions with atmospheric aerosol. Very interesting. I've it's got a question. It's probably competing. It's probably multiple processes oh. occurring. Um, the good news for the dating work is that no matter which hypothesis, all the hypotheses that are proposed, that that carbon is from you know, contemporary sources. So you're dating when that accretion was formed. Um, you know, so it doesn't matter if it's a microbial growth or if it's an aerosol deposition, that carbon is the same age as when that accretion formed. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I've got a question. Yes. Basic question here. An archaeological site, you mentioned um, um, wood, charcoal, and paint. 
What other items can you use carbon-14 data for, like pottery, I assume like wood from a frame? Could you just give me some other ideas, kind of a more basic question? There? Yeah, there's a lot of materials that are radiocarbon dated. So anything that was once living can be radiocarbon dated. So you can have, um, I mean, charcoal is the most abundant thing that archaeologists radiocarbon date because they find it. And so, um, you know, it, it's something that they, they have. Um, but you can date um, collagen from bone. Um, you can date, um, if you have like a, a basket or a sandal, any kind of organic, um, you know, material, it's anything that was once living. So, you know. A plethora, a plethora of things in the lower Pecos. Right. So that's the, the beauty of the lower Pecos is we have excellent preservation of organic materials. A lot of times in archaeological excavations, the organic stuff doesn't preserve. And so um, you may have stone tools, which that would be, there's nothing, you know, there might be a residue on the stone tool, but it, it's probably not enough to get a radiocarbon date. You mentioned pottery. Um, that's a little harder. Um, but if there's a residue on the inside of the pot, or if um, in the matrix, there's like some kind of organic um, fibers. Um, I've seen people date like on um, like plastered walls where sometimes like uh, straw fibers have been included in that um, to date uh, sort of construction of Southwest structures. Um, but wood is the most common thing that is radiocarbon dated. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so somebody asked, uh, when you go past 40,000 or 50,000 years old, how do you get older dates? Um, and so that's when you're doing other isotopes that have longer half-lives. Um, so something like uranium thorium um, that has a longer half-life than carbon-14 um, would be um, what's used to date things that are older uh, than argon, what argon. can do, huh? Argon, argon. Yeah, you can do argon, argon, potassium, argon. There's all kinds of other isotopes that have these longer um, half-lives that can be used. Um, and then there is things like um, thermoluminescence dating and optically stimulated luminescence dating uh, that can also go back um, further. Um, for a while, it was hard to, it was kind of like a small gap. There were some techniques that were really good at dating really old things. And then radiocarbon was kind of dated younger things, if you might say. Um, but now there um, are some techniques that kind of help fill in. There was sort of a gap from about 50 to about 80 to 90,000. But now um, things like um, OSL and, and TL can do um, those those um, areas. And, and like you said, argon, argon and, and so forth. Um, where in the world are the oldest pictographs found so far? Um, I think that's probably up for debate um, because not all of the rock art around the world has been dated. Um, but, you know, there's the stuff in uh, Europe. Uh, Chauvet Cave has some pretty old ages of about 38,000, I think, is the oldest. There might be some at 42. I'm not sure. Um, and then there's a site in Indonesia that um, some people have done some uranium thorium dating that suggests that those paintings uh, may be uh, quite old as well. Um, how do you wash paint samples if you make them into powder? Or how do you wash paint samples in general? Okay, um, so uh, so what I didn't talk about was kind of how we sometimes dissect these little paint flakes in the laboratory. Um, and we do that under a microscope. So sometimes we might remove an outer accretion layer um, with a scalpel blade um, and we do that under the microscope. But when, once we get that paint layer off, um, uh, it is kind of a powder. Um, and so we use uh, sterile uh, test tubes um, and the powder gets weighed into that sterile test tube. And then you just pour the liquid in and put a cap on it and shake it up. Um, we use something called an ultrasonic water bath. It's the same thing that you see at the dentist or at a jeweler that buzzes and it has the sound waves go through uh, the liquid. Um, and so it causes um, there to be less surface tension. So it allows uh, those liquids to get into all the cracks and crevices. Um, and then we use a centrifuge, which spins down that powder. So you have the powder down at the bottom and you have the liquid at the top. And so then you're able to pour off that liquid, um, but still have that powder um, in the bottom. 
Um, and so it's wet at that point. And so then you, you have to um, filter it. So you, you pour that onto a, a quartz fiber filter. Um, and then, um, then you have it kind of on this, this glass frit that then gets loaded into the instrument. Any other questions? Question, can you give a general idea how accurate carbon dating is it within a hundred years? I mean, does it vary a lot? It does vary some because it depends on um, how big your sample is. It depends on how old your sample is um, because you do that measurement. And if you're measuring something that's say within the last 2000 years, that has a lot of more carbon 14 in it. Whereas if you're dating something that's 40,000 years old, you have a lot less material to measure. And so you get a little bit larger error bars or plus or minuses. Um, I would say sort of in the um, 15,000 years ago to now, uh, when you get a radiocarbon age back um, from the AMS lab, you'll get a plus or minus usually about 35 or 40 years. Um, but then that has to be calibrated and converted into a calendar age. And that's where the majority of the error gets added on. And so usually you're looking at a two to 400 year range. Um, but it's not, you know, so you're not getting like they painted it on October 7th, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't get exactly uh, how old, but you get a good idea. And if you do a lot of measurements, you can do things like average dates and um, or if you get a sequence of dates, there's some interesting statistics that you can do um, that can really help um, even narrow that down um, a little bit further. OK, uh, one more question, guys. Anybody? I mean, looked into DNA and paint because they have spit, fat, and all that in it. Yeah, so there was a study done um, in about 1992-ish, 1993, when ancient DNA was very new. Um, and uh, it was, again, my, a student uh, of my PhD advisor, um, Marvin Rowe, um, and they uh, did look at DNA and... Um, they for the lower Pecos. So this was looking at the rock art, uh, rock art here in Southwest Texas, and they determined that the DNA was from an ungulate or a single hoofed animal. Um, and that kind of matches what we thought from sort of some ethnography and some indigenous information in that um, they might have been using bone marrow from deer to uh, make uh, the art because there's a lot of fat in uh, the bone marrow. Um, but in science, you do what any good science do scientist does, you try to replicate your results. And so then there was another poor graduate student who was sent to try to replicate the results. And he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried and he didn't get anything. Um, he was using a different method. He was using more specific primers for the DNA to try to get which species of animal um, it would be. Um, whereas in the first study, they were just like, do we get any DNA at all? Um, and so uh, what they found was that they didn't find anything in the second test. And so that sort of has two possible conclusions. Um, the first is that maybe in the first study, the DNA, the sample was contaminated. Um, and they found out that it was a lab that had had uh, cattle research done in it before. And so it could be that they were amplifying modern DNA and thinking that it was, they were amplifying the contamination. The other possibility though, is that the first study was correct, but that the DNA was in such poor condition that when they used the more specific primers, they weren't getting amplification. And so um, no other work has been done on that since about 1994-ish. Um, and, you know, DNA, especially ancient DNA research has come a long way since then. There's a lot more um, statistical analysis. Um, the way you do the tests are fairly similar, but how you interpret the data is different. And so I think it'd be really interesting to have maybe a graduate student work on that question um, and see if um, we could, you know, try to solve that that mystery. Um, another thing I'd like to look at 
for its proteins because, um, you know, if they are using the bone marrow, there's a lot of collagen there and you might be able to, to see that collagen, but we have not definitively uh, identified the organic material in the paint. We know there's a lot of organic material in the paint and not any in the unpainted rock, but we still don't know exactly what that material is. But my goodness, thank you all so much. And um, I've enjoyed sharing something that I'm passionate about with you guys. So thank you.